terms of uh, EMP weapons, we touched on that last time a little bit. Uh, I just wanted you to expound a bit more on the difference between a super EMP weapon and a standard EMP weapon. All, all nuclear weapons will make EMP because they all put out gamma rays. And the gamma rays knock electrons off of ox oxid molecules high in the atmosphere. And they spin at the speed of light, you know, around the Earth's lines of gravitational force. And the more of these electrons that you can have out there spinning, because an EMP is just uh, EMP 101, it's just a moving magnetic field, okay? And, and so you've got a moving magnetic field that's moving at the speed of light. And, and, uh, and that can generate tremendously powerful pulse on the ground uh, for a normal nuclear weapon, say a one megaton weapon, you know, it could be 50,000 volts per meter. That means for every meter of exposure of the target, it gets 50,000 volts injected into it at the speed of light. So a car might be four meters long, four times 50,000, that's 200,000 volts injected into your car at the speed of light. Now, those are nuclear weapons of normal design. Any nuclear weapon can make that kind of EMP. That's why any nuclear weapon is an EMP threat. But there's this special category of weapon called a super EMP weapon, which is specifically designed to make EMP an only EMP. And it's tuned to put out gamma rays. It puts out a lot more gamma rays than a normal nuclear weapon. So it knocks a lot more electrons off of, uh, off of these oxygen molecules. The Compton effect is much greater and you can achieve much higher field strengths, like, I mean, 50,000 volts. It's already an almost imaginably, you know, powerful thing, but you could get 100,000, 200,000 volts. And because the, uh, because the weapon is designed to put out gamma rays and not make, you know, a normal nuclear weapon is just, is usually configured to make a big blast and thermal effects, okay? But because you're focused on gamma rays, you know, the weapon can be really small in terms of yield. You know, the, the actual explosive yield might be as a kiloton, three kilotons, even a fraction of a kiloton. Hmm. You know, the, the yield doesn't add anything to the EMP capabilities. You're trying to convert as much of the energy of the bomb into gamma rays to make an EMP weapon. Ideally, you want a pure EMP weapon that doesn't produce any, EM, any yield at all. And that's the difference. And so these super EMP weapons, in addition to being much more powerful in terms of EMP, uh, they're also very small. So you could put it in a satellite, like one of these North Korean satellites, or you could launch it off a Scud missile, you know, a small missile, and, uh, and have a tremendous EMP effect uh, as a consequence of this. Uh, and then there are non-nuclear EMP weapons, of course. They're much less powerful than the nuclear EMP weapons, but over short distances, they can generate 50,000, 100,000 volts per meter, you know, over maybe a couple of kilometers. And uh, CHAMP is a good example of this. The U.S. Air Force, you know, has got a cruise missile that's got a non-nuclear EMP warhead that constantly puts out a pulse, you know, uh, of thousands of volts per meter. And you can program this thing to follow the power lines so that it'll blow, uh, it'll black out the transformers. You know, we've got CHAMPs forward deployed in Japan. So, you know, one of our desperate measures would be if we thought North Korea was getting to ready to make a nuclear attack, we might send these champs out to black out North Korea, you know, to interfere with their, maybe even fry the missiles themselves, fry the electronics and the missiles themselves and interfere with their command and control systems. So there are non-nuclear EMP and then there's nuclear, uh, in nuclear EMP associated with a, a weapon of normal design. Uh, and then there are super EMP weapons that are special nuclear weapons that are specifically for. Uh, in the doctrine of Russia and China and North Korea, though, they're not considered nuclear weapons. They're considered electronic weapons or cyber weapons, you know, because they don't do what a normal nuclear weapon does. I mean, it's not being used to blast a city. It's not creating radioactive fallout. It's put, not putting out thermal effects. All it does is, it, uh, and it doesn't kill people directly. You know, it it kills electronics. And they're right. From the physics standpoint, it's not really a nuclear weapon. It's a, I mean, we're using nuclear energy to generate the EMP effect. But, you know, does that really make it a nuclear weapon? You know, we don't consider 
cruise missile strikes that are launched from an atomic, a nuclear powered submarine to be a nuclear attack. Uh, so it's not really an outrageous thing for them to think, well, these super EMP weapons are really not nuclear weapons. We're not crossing that nuclear line by using them. We're in the realm of cyber warfare or electronic warfare when we're using them, which makes it all the more likely that they would use them. Yeah, and it's scary to know that they're <clears throat> so small. I wasn't aware of that. So thanks uh, for explaining that to us, because I think a lot of people don't understand they think super EMP weapon, well, it requires a much more sophisticated delivery system. That's what I would presume. But you're saying that it doesn't require that at all, which is even... Uh, well, the warhead design is, 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 and it is a more sophisticated warhead design. It's, it's a, what we would call a third generation nuclear weapon. And so it's more sophisticated than these weapons designed for blast and shock. Uh, but, you know, it's not designed for blast and shock. And, it's designed mm -hmm. for putting out gamma rays. And so you can do that with these very low yields. The Russians have other third generation weapons tuned for X-rays, others tuned for neutron radiation. You know, some of them are called mini neutron bombs. You know, theoretically you could have a round like that in a tank, you know, and, 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 and you go in with your Abrams and you think you're gonna have a classic artillery duel with the other side, but they've actually got a neutron bomb that they're going to fire at you, you know, from, from their tank. That's uh, an example of a nuclear revolution in military affairs that we have not participated in because we have, we have not, all our nuclear weapons are based on this older technology from the Cold War for blast and shock. And this is another part of the deter nuclear deterrence crisis, a big gap between our capabilities. Even the, even the North Koreans have got super EMP weapons. We don't have a super EMP weapon. Hmm. And it's concerning because, you know, these could potentially already be on some satellites just waiting to be uh, executed. And I, I guess another big concern would be that if these low yield tactical uh, weapons, I could see a world where it became normalized for the use of these low, low yield tactical nukes or these neutron rounds that the that becomes an acceptable part of war. And then the nuclear threshold gets pushed back a bit. So it doesn't necessarily entail an escalation where NATO says, okay, well, they're only shooting tactical nukes. You know, they're not, you know, using strategic nukes. So I guess we don't have to, you know, ratchet up the DEF CON level. Could you foresee that happening where these uh, third or what fourth generation nu nuclear tipped bullets or missiles or, you know, that that becomes normalized in war? Yeah, I could see that happen. And I'm very uh, uh, concerned that it could happen. Uh, the Biden administration and its advisors have been far too publicly outspoken. But what we will not do in response to Russian use of tactical nuclear weapons, you know, there's, there's either in foreign policy or foreign affairs, but there's been quite a few articles where, uh, where former Obama administration people and people who advise the Biden administration have, have addressed the question about, well, what if Russia does use tactical nuclear weapons? And almost a universal response among them is, well, we shouldn't escalate to the nuclear level. What we should do is employ even tighter economic sanctions and, uh, and we should uh, ostracize them from the global community. And, and they'll never come into the G7 again. And all these, all these things that are telegraphing to, to the Russians and the Chinese and the North Koreans, that they could actually get away with using, using tactical nuclear weapons and we won't respond by using tactical nuclear weapons such as, such as we have ourselves. I mean, the deterrent is already so weak and not incredible, but then to have our political and military leaders and advisors talking like that in public, it's very worrisome. And another myth that's out there you know, is the, and, and this is actually a mainstream view. I don't mean to belittle it by calling it a left view, okay? But I think in the mainstream view of Washington and our allies in Europe, we have spent so many decades during the Cold War and afterwards convincing ourselves that nuclear war is unwinnable and unthinkable 
so that only a small group of you know specialists do think about it. Okay, but and I I think that's been on purpose because what they've tried to do is create an international norm, or at least they've convinced themselves that they were doing is creating an international norm, so that everybody would agree that a nuclear war is unthinkable and you can't use nuclear weapons. It would be breaking. I think they call it the nuclear taboo. If you had to put it in two words, it's the nuclear taboo. Well, the Russians and Chinese and North Koreans have never accepted the nuclear taboo. They've encouraged us to have our nuclear taboo because they know it, 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 it helps weaken us, okay? But they've never accepted that. And I think one of the things I'm most afraid of is that the first country, whether it's Iran or North Korea or Russia or China, the first country that uses nuclear weapons, you know, is suddenly going to dominate the world order overnight because that country will be the most feared country in the world because they all violated that nuclear taboo. And our own leaders are so afraid of nuclear weapons, that we will never use them. For us, they are just a bluff. They are just a deterrent. And we have brainwashed ourselves into a position where people like me won't be listened to and our own Pentagon won't be listened to. And in some circumstances, I would certainly agree. I don't want to fight a nuclear war for Ukraine, all right? Uh, you know, but uh, when you think of the use of nuclear weapons as a taboo, and you make that sort of an official part of your doctrine, and you say things like, well, a nuclear war can never be won and must never be fought, you're signaling to the other side uh, that all they've got to do is use nuclear weapons, and they can, they can blow us away. They can dominate the world order. These country, unlike the United States, the United States and the West, we want to be loved, all right? Uh, you know, and so we rely on international law and negotiations and trying to see the other fellow's point of view because in our strategic culture, we believe in win-win outcomes and, and friendship and, and contracts. And in effect, we, we, we want to be liked and loved by the other side. That's not the case with the strategic cultures of totalitarian systems. They want to be feared. You know, Mark Machiavelli said it is better to be feared than loved. And he's right when it comes to international relations. Uh, fine if they fear us, uh, it will be the view of these nuclear weapon states. They will fear us and obey us. And, uh, and then we will see that Colin S. Gray will be proven right. Because I think that even all they have to do is engage in very limited nuclear use to demonstrate their political will, to break that nuclear taboo. And then they will be so feared that they can probably get anything they want and win the nuclear war just the way you would win on a chessboard with your queen and your rook, just by the mere existence, the mere threat of the employment of those, uh, of those powerful systems. Yeah, and it seems like if they were to do something like that, we would be you know, put in a position where we would be scrambling to dust off outdated equipment, which would be wholly ineffective in uh, resisting any sort of threat, especially like you say, from a, a committed authoritarian regime that is willing to sacrifice a lot more people than we perhaps are. I, I know you got to go. So I want to thank you for coming out once again. And where can people find more information uh, about yourself and your work? Well, we have a, a website called uh, emptaskforce.us. But the best thing is, is my books. You know, you could just Google my name, Dr. Peter Vincent Pry, and all my books are available through amazon.com. I'm also published in, in you know, Washington Times and, and Newsmax. I guess for the EMP crowd, uh, the, you know, if you wanted to read one book, I would recommend uh, The Power and the Light. And that will make you an expert on, on EMP with that one, one book. Excellent. That's great to know. I'm going to post some links in the description. And I will ask my viewers, if you did have any questions for uh, Dr. Pry for when we do uh, do the trilogy to this series, please post them in the comment section below. And uh, thanks again for coming out. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to your audience.